Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to and Jeff Berkowitz is joining us, and we're going to be discussing some of the major issues, both nationally and what's happened this week in Illinois in the legislature where some big things were passed. Jeff, I want to point out for the viewers first that you had an accident recently. You had uh, some swelling of the eyes, a little bit of a black eyes, I should maybe bigger, a lot of a black eyes, but you're you're recovering. So people might say, <laughs> What is that? That's uh, why is Burke what's looking so differently? It's because of right. No need accident. to send the get well cards. We're on the men. Everything's good. And I'm going to punch Terry back in his eye to get even. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, I know. We'll, we'll see if we can have a Donnybrook verbally it's a friendly, today. Friendly rivalry here, folks. We're not really going at each other's throats. But let's start off. One of the things we're going to start off with, instead of starting off with Illinois, let's start off with uh, what's going on around the nation. And as we approach the uh, election next year of 2022, there is a precursor election that kind of gives an indication of which way the, uh, the, the voters are feeling. And that election is the governor's race in Virginia, which is going to be on November 2nd. That is Tuesday, mm -hmm. November 2nd, coming up. And Jeff, it's a surprise. This was a, uh, a foregone conclusion by many analysts in that the Virginia election would again go to the Democrat, Terry McAuliffe, who previously served one term as the governor of Virginia. But the surprise is that a Republican who has never held election thus far is now leading the race. Uh, and that is a shocker. Uh, that's, you <clears throat> that's Glenn Youngkin. And as people can see there, just two weeks ago, Youngkin was down five points. It was close to a statistical tie. But Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat, was ahead former governor seeking another term after taking a break. But now the news yesterday, the 28th, Fox News poll, and we're taping this on October 29th, Fox News poll has Youngkin a, a leading by eight points. It's no longer a statistical tie. Youngkin is in the lead in Virginia. Virginia had been for many years a, uh, a red state. It had become two decades ago a purple state. It had become almost blue. The news in the last few days, it's back as a red state again. Glenn Youngkin, Glenn Youngkin could be pulling a major upset. And if he does that, is that a barometer? Is that a barometer for what might happen in the 22, 2022 midterms, as you said? And do, are there any lessons there for the Illinois governor's race as well? Well, or, or not just the Illinois, but also nationally, uh, as nationally, we go into course, Congress. Nationally. And the yes. thing is, what is upsetting me? Uh, you know, I used to live in Virginia. I lived in Loudoun County. It was Loudoun County, Virginia, that is the poster boy, so to speak, for the parents protesting against what's been going on in their schools uh, with the teaching of critical race theory, uh, especially there is a rape in uh, Loudoun County schools by uh, a boy who said he was transsexual and went into the girl's bathroom. What we can see now as we look at this race and the way the education issue is playing out, that that is critical to the election in Virginia. And as we said before, people across the country, the political candidates, uh, the pollsters, the analysts are going to be paying attention to what's been going on here, which is why we want to focus on this. And you can see here <coughs> where Glenn Youngkin, the uh, Republican <coughs> candidate, uh, on top there, it's 40 52% now in the recent poll compared to Terry McAuliffe at 40%. And again, that is stunning news for the Democrats who thought this was going to be a walk in the park for them to have their well, candidate reelected. And people saw this coming perhaps because as you mentioned the education issue, who who really controls the schools? Do the parents control the schools or do the superintendents and board members who are no longer responsive? And so that issue has been bubbling up for the last few weeks. It's been on that has been making national news that coverage. It's bubbled up into the handling of that by the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. And so you can see that last two weeks, Youngkin has pulled ahead, not just in the vote, but also in partly because of who can do a better job in education. That's probably why he's ahead on the vote. And Jeff, that's let's also reasons. take a look. Obviously, the uh, the economy is always an issue. Let's look at what they're doing on the economy. Uh, and we see here again, 53% uh, for the Republican Youngkin 
in the latest poll compared to McAuliffe at 42 uh, percent. Many right, people have said, there. I'm sorry. Who can, the slight typo it should read, who can do a better job on the economy? Right. He's also ahead on COVID. I don't know. They may also maybe ahead on crime. These are all things that are bubbling up nationally. Education, COVID, the economy, crime, sweeping the country, sweeping Illinois, sweeping Virginia. So we could ask, are the governor, we have a race, we have a Republican primary. It will heat up more when we get to the general election. Our Pritzker, is Pritzker the Democrat and whoever the Republican nominee going to be for governor? Will they be battling out similar issues on education, on COVID, on the economy, and on crime? So we are talking Illinois issues. We're also talking national issues. You know, the There's other thing, convergence here. I want to insert <clears throat> briefly here that the other thing that happened this week, speaking of the Virginia race and the role of education and the protests, uh, the Attorney General of the United States went before the Senate Judiciary Committee, chaired by Dick Durbin, uh, and the Attorney General, uh, trying to use the proper language, uh, was hammered. That's a nice way of saying it. He had his butt kicked is another way of saying it. He was hammered on this memo that he put out to the U.S. attorneys uh, to be looking uh, at possible prosecution of pr parents protesting at school boards. And it turned out that he, while he said a letter, there is a rise in incidents, he had no factual basis when pressed by Republicans to support that allegation. And yet he still stood by his memo and refused <clears throat> to take it down. But uh, uh, it, it is notable that this is not only an issue of concern by parents, uh, apparently across the country, uh, but that the Attorney General, in addition, has also made a major mm -hmm. misstep. And by the way, we should have said Terry McCullough spoke at one of the debates and said that parents should not have a role in uh, what's being taught at the schools. And that was a major misstep. That's uh, many analysts thus far in the Virginia governor's race said that was a major misstep as what's maybe that one statement cost them a call off the race. Well, the specific quote is parents shouldn't be telling the schools what to teach. Yes, they shouldn't be setting out the curriculum, but they should certainly have an impact. They certainly should have a voice on that. You know, should we be teaching our kids that America is a systemically uh, uh, prejudicial or systemically biased country? Are they systemically biased? Or, or making or making uh, white children feel inferior because they're white. I mean, that they are, there is instruction that, uh, right. you know, you are implicitly, even, I mean, kids and, you know, the in grade school, young kids uh, teaching them they're racist because they're white. It's just ridiculous. Right. And was the country born in racism? Is the country defective in terms of its constitution, its declaration of independence? Some of those things are being taught. Should parents have a role in that? Of course. Parents elect the school board members. They're supposed to be responsive to the parents. They're almost, almost uniformly across the country. And soon in Chicago, the parents will be electing their school board members as well. So how, you know, uh, who, does Terry McAuliffe really want to say Terrence, parents should not be telling schools what to teach, should not be having a voice in what they teach? Well, I think we're, that was a major misstep, major misstatement by Terry McAuliffe, and the attorney general is going down the same wrong path when he starts to characterize parents who are protesting, who are and voicing legitimate okay. concerns at school board meetings, and he is saying this is domestic terrorism? No, no, no. Merrick Garland doesn't want to go down that path to call parents domestic terrorists, right? There, let's, uh, let's move along because another thing that's happened uh, this week in the legislature, the fall veto session of the state legislature, a couple of major pieces of legislation came up. One was uh, overriding the parental notification when minors have abortions. Uh, that's been the law in the United States, or I should say in Illinois, for uh, maybe 25 years or so. Uh, the Illinois legislature revoked that. Let's take a listen first to uh, Representative Gon Gertwitz, a uh, Democrat, on this uh, bill. We're talking about those who don't have the privilege 
of having a healthy relationship with their parent, and that is their judgment to make. Prior to becoming a legislator, I represented child trafficking victims, children who were sold by their parents, for whom home was not a safe place, and parents were not trusted adults. So uh, it was a very compelling, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to do justice to some of the lawmakers here, just taking some bites. Very compelling and emotional debate. Uh, we just heard from Representative Gon Gertwitz. Uh, also, here's Representative Boss. Uh, he also, by the way, both of these people, to their credit, have worked uh, in the effort of trying to save young girls from sexual slavery, which <clears throat> we don't hear much about, but they both testified that this goes on far more than we would like to think. Uh, here's Representative Boss uh, talking about how because of parental notification that he was supporting keeping it that way, actually had helped uh, save at least one of the people who had been captured and put into sexual slavery. This is not hyperbole. This is fact. This is fact. I have looked into the eyes of one of these girls. I have seen a pain that you cannot know. But I've also seen healing that was able to happen after her rescue. A rescue that happened because her parents were notified. I ask you today to stand with this brave girl and all the other victims. Stand with these girls. It is our responsibility as legislators to pass laws that protect our most vulnerable children and not put them at greater risk. Very compelling uh, there, Jeff. Uh and the legislature did vote. The Democratic majority gets their way. The Republicans are a minority of a minority, so that uh, they did overrule that, so there's no longer parental notification going to be uh, in Illinois. It was a close vote in that the Democrats have 73 votes, a uh, super majority, but I think in this vote, it was something like 62. They lost a number of Democrats who either didn't vote, voted pre or voted present, or voted against this. Um, and so, look, there's an important issue here. Which, which by the way, let me, before you go, it's not true that all Democrats just vote the party line, and that's the point that you're making. And when you get some right. of these compelling, gut-wrenching issues, and this is not an easy vote on either side, you know, and I, I think this is where we want to have, for all the time we bash politicians, we want to say, you know, this was a very uh, vote of conscience, I think, for, for both members of both parties here, the members of the legislature, which is why it didn't go down in strictly party lines. Well, in some of these districts downstate, they used to be strongly pro-life. Some of the districts downstate who are, that are Demo have Democrat state state rep state state, uh, state senators are still somewhat pro life, and they're still concerned about removing this parental notification. Again, it's not even that parents have to consent; they should just be notified that their minor child, who may be 12 or 13 years or 13 years old, is going to have a significant procedure, uh, an abortion. And, and let's not forget an the here. parents. That's the that's the parents' grandchild, and mm -hmm. and the, the idea that you, as as some in the Republican side especially were saying, you can't have your child get an aspirin at grade school without being notified. You have to have parental notification before the nurse can give your kid an aspirin. Uh, and now that they are uh, going to have kids who are maybe in their early teens, perhaps 14, 15 years old, could have an abortion and not have their parents notified. Well, the thing is, if people watch the 35 minutes that you've put up, Terry, of a selection of Democrat and Republican legislators of this debate, 35 minutes, they will see there are issues here that need to be flushed out more, and sadly, we're not. Because Mike Boss is talking about, as you did, the sex trafficking that goes on, and we really want to have parents or guardians notified if there are young kids who are being abused and then get pregnant and then they push ahead with an abortion without even telling the guardian or parent, 
that's not so good. They, then we may stop some of the sex trafficking that's going on if we use that as a trigger to get into this issue. On the other hand, as Representative Gong Gershwitz points out, there are some issues here in terms of some families where parents are, necess are not necessarily going to be thoughtful and supportive in, ch in helping a young child, young daughter, make a decision. And so, and maybe the judicial bypass is not a perfect substitute because maybe a 12 year old or 13 year old, Gong Gershowitz says, has to go out and get a lawyer, pay for the lawyer, handle all of this, deal with a judge in a very tough situation. So maybe there's a better way. Maybe we can have assistance to these young girls that is more neutral, that is not promoting abortion, but maybe is saying, let's help this person handle this. And in some instances, maybe the parents shouldn't be notified for the reasons we've given. Well, Kelly and Cassidy, Representative support. Kelly Cassidy said, you know, we're, we're not always talking here about families, uh, you know, who, where the relationship between the parents and the child are great relationships. Obviously, at some parts in our society, uh, you have incest going on. You have right. sexual abuse by family members. Uh, you know, it's it's the, my point would be it's not necessarily an easy decision here when you get into these. There are compelling arguments uh, on both sides, and to and their the and to their credit, I would say the House had compelling arguments on both sides. Yeah, the suggestion of reform, the debate we saw, which took place in the last few days, really should have occurred months ago, if not years ago, and the legislators should have been working on a refinement of this law that handled both the concerns of Representative Boss do you, and Representative Do you have Congress. an idea in mind or are you just? Yeah, I would I would do something on the judicial bypass. If it's as bad as Gong Gershwin said, let's fi find a way to have a neutral advocate that is there on behalf of the young minor to, if there's going to be a judicial bypass, to make it so that that's available. And the, Well, that, that could so still that, be done, uh, maybe, anyway. But, well, so the other, the other suggestion is, these debates shouldn't just be 10 minute statements or five minute statements. We should have some questions back and forth between Mike Boss questioning Gong Gershowitz. They and have that. Versa. They have that. Well, I, they I have don't that. see it so much. The, the problem is it's three minutes, minutes, but when you have that many people and they're doing this in a shortened, you know, it's the uh, fall veto session, they only have so many days. So your point, point the, your larger point, I would take. Uh, that my that point, these are not being this, debated this. enough, perhaps uh, my, as they my should. My point is this. Look, let's larger point. One more statement, and then we're going to move along. Yeah, twenty six years we've had this law around. That's plenty of time for state reps and state senators and the governor at that time to work to make this a better law. That was not done. Repeal probably was not a good idea. Leaving it alone and doing nothing was not a good idea. We could have made everybody better off by refining this law. Okay. That's my point. Let's leave it at that. The other thing we want to get to is the Right of Conscience Act. It's been a law in Illinois for a number of years. And it says that if you have a personal, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some medical treatment goes against your political or not your religious beliefs or your own conscious, but you don't have to be even a believer in God, but violates your, your personal values, you can uh, defer from having that. Now, the problem is the governor wants to have a mandate to vax every, everyone vaccinated, that if you're going to be working for the state and government, you, you have to be uh, vaccinated. And this was a problem. The Right of Conscience Act was a problem. The legislator voted to amend that. And one of those who objected was Representative uh, uh, Mazaki. She is interesting because she started a law firm and her whole focus has been on the pharmaceutical, the medical field. She's very informed and uh, she was one of the principal people speaking on this uh, on the Republican side. Let's take a listen. This legislation is designed to lead to absurd results where you can let an employer or any person employed by any unit of government in the state of Illinois force a person to do things, even things your doctor thinks is medically contraindicated, wrong, or harmful. And tonight, your yes vote means you've denied them a remedial claim. They get nothing in a court of law. 
Okay. There you go. Uh, and compelling, compelling moments on both of these issues in the legislature. Those are on the Illinois Channel uh, for your viewing more than just a soundbite, and that's uh, YouTube.com Illinois Channel TV if you wish to look at that. Jeff, we also had discussions on uh, redistricting in the fall legislature, and we are going to have uh, that impact, strongly impact, wh who are going to be members of Congress uh, representing Illinois in the Congress in 2022. So where do you want to start? You want to start with the uh, Democratic districts? Let's start. There. Right. Let's give people an idea. We have 17 congressional districts. We've lost one seat because Illinois is one of three states losing population in the country, only three states. So we've lost. We've gone from 18 to 17. But let's give people an idea of the broad sweep, and we'll talk about some of the more significant changes. All right. Let's bring this up. And here we have uh, political leanings of the congressional districts based, as you would say, Jeff, on the 2016 U.S. Senate race. Explain that. Right. So we have a way of looking and comes from the Illinois General Assembly puts out this data on if you take um, a race like the 2016 U.S. Senate race between Mark Kirk and um, Tammy Duckworth. And you say if all the people, if we if we redistricted Bobby Rush's district, and those people, uh, it's been redistricted, and we looked at how they voted in 2016, who are now in his new district that's redistricted, it would be a plus 48 percent Democratic relative to Republicans. That is a tremendously gerrymandered district, tremendously pro-Democratic, or uh, you could say leaning, but it's strong Democratic district. That district will never vote for a Republican. It's a terrible thing. We shouldn't have this kind of country where we have this kind of district redistricting. District well, this, this is where uh, the critics, of, the, the critics of redistricting say that this is where the uh, politicians pick their voters instead of the voters picking the politicians. And they stack these districts often, uh, as you just point out in the first district, so strongly Democratic. The same with Robin Kelly's second district. She right. will not, it would be miraculous to have either of those defeated by a Republican candidate. You got the same with Chewy Garcia in the fourth. So, uh, and Danny Davis in the seventh, look at that. 67% Se uh, basically, or plus 67 so Democratic. Let's point, out, let's point out a few of the things on this chart and then we'll go to another slide. But the main thing here is that the, Repu the Democrats are concerned about the redistricting by federal law, the Voting Rights Act and other legislation. An important issue is do you have majority minority districts as the population changes, as Illinois becomes more Latino? We have one of our 17 districts that are majority minority, majority Latino, and that's the fourth currently held by Chewy Garcia. And they this the legislature, the Democrats have created in a way of hoping this now survives federal scrutiny because this will be challenged in the courts to create a, a second a majority minority Latino district. And that's the third congressional district, which has been held or is being currently held as Marie Newman as the incumbent. And now they've put her, they've actually put her in the fourth. She's announced she's not going to run where her house is now in the fourth congressional district against Chewy Garcia. We'll come to this in a second. She's now saying she'll run in the sixth which we'll show you in another slide, 6th Congressional District. But that's a change in the 3rd. And also the 13th, which was Rodney Davis's district, and now has been changed to be much more Democratic than it was. And that's now, they put Rodney in the 15th, his home there. We'll come to that in a second. So of these eight seats, these states will most likely stay Democratic. 13th is less than the other ones, but still strongly Democratic, most likely. Let's go to the second slide to give people an idea of, well, maybe go to the third slide. Well, you can't hear tell it. me which one the third is. Let's go to the, it's the Republican district, uh, the ones that show strong Republican districts as currently comprised. So these are three strong GOP districts after redistricting. So, the, the, so we have Mike Boston in the, in the 12th. This is in the very southern part of the state. And you got uh, first-termer uh, Mary Miller. 
uh, who they put Mary. Here's the trick: they they the Democrats are trying to pit Republican incumbent against Republican incumbent. So they took Mary Miller and put her her house in the twelfth, thinking if she doesn't want to run as a carpetbagger, she'll have to run against Mike Boss, and they'll get rid of one of the Republican incumbents. And they got That's that in the sixteenth now with the uh, Kinzinger uh, against La Hood. Yeah. However, what's the news? As we tape this on October twenty nine, what's the news? Adam Kinzinger has announced in a video he's not going to run for Congress for re-election. His good friend, even though they differ on many issues, is um, is yeah. Darren LaHood. He's not going to run against LaHood. He's not saying what he'll do, whether he'll run for governor or run for the U.S. Senate, whether he'll take a TV slot. He's not dropping out of politics, but he's not going to run in the 16th. Let's so move. Let's move along. We got four minutes left here. Okay, but real quick, real quick. So what? And Mary Miller has said. She's not going to, she's thinking of maybe running against Rodney Davis if he runs in the 15th, or if he chooses to run for governor, then she would run there. So the point is, folks, people don't have to run from the district in which their house is. You don't have to live in that district. You just have to live in the state. Okay. Now let's go to where there's possibly some competition. These are six districts that are Democratic, but they are less Democratic than the first eight we looked at based on the 2016 U.S. Senate race as a barometer of how Democratic or, uh, or How Republican. the voters vote Democratic or Republican. Right. And you can see the 6th District is much less Democratic, more, uh, uh, more uh, competitive than other districts. And we've said that Newman has said even though she's been put in the 4th, she'd rather apparently run against another She's progressive, another progressive, Sean Caston, then she would run, want to run in the fourth. So one of, those of one of those members that are currently in are going to be out, Caston or and Newman? Many of her voters, many of her voters from the fourth, from the third, have been put in the sixth. So that could be a fairly close Democratic primary. And the other thing to note, Bill Foster in the 11th, they've shaved it a little close. That might be a more competitive race than some people would have thought if a Republican steps up to run there uh, of some note. And Lauren Underwood, although it says a plus 10, that's viewed as more likely. That's probably off. It's probably more competitive. That was previously held for a long time by Republicans before Lauren Underwood run it, won it more than two years ago. And the 17th with Sherry Bustos, who had been the incumbent Democrat, she's not running for re-election. Republicans and they have Esther Joy King, who ran a tough race and a close race last time. That might be a very competitive Republican Democratic race. And and sure. and in in the uh, 2016, I don't remember the 2020, but uh, a number of those counties in the 17th, uh, at least the pre the existing 17th district went for Trump. So that that right, is not is you know Sherry Bustos was doing good as a Democrat to be elected in that area. And the Wall Street Journal will just say editorialized. We got about one minute, uh, by the way. So. Wall Street Journal editorialized uh, against Illinois, or saying Illinois is one of the worst. Particularly said the sixth and the fourteenth and seventeenth Democrats are trying in this effort to try to shore them up. So I think we've given you a good sense of where things went on redistricting. We've given you a good sense of what's happened in Virginia and how that may impact the country in Illinois. So I think we've done a fairly good job in all modesty of bringing you folks up to date. I right think there. so, and, and uh, like I said, they ought to uh, go if they want. They can uh, take some screenshots of these uh, graphics we have so you can kind of keep an eye on that. Jeff, we're gonna cut it off here. Folks, thanks for watching. Give us your comments and uh, share the video and if you like, want to. If you like us, if you like us, let us know on Facebook or on YouTube when you go there and give us your comments. We want to hear from you. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for joining us.